Hi, friends. Welcome to Getting Your Real Estate Life Together. I'm Tracy Hicks with All Things Real Estate. And I'm super excited to interview Mike. And I'm going to call you Mike Motorbike because I have tried to Google your name and have the Google lady tell me how to say it. And I was like, I'm still going to butcher it. So I'm yeah, it's, it's such a horrible last name, Michalowicz. But yeah, my nickname in high school is Mike Motorbike. So we can go with that. Right on. I feel like we're friends. So yeah. <laughs> So Mike, your new book, Fix This Next, I got it last week and started reading it. And I do most of my my business books online on Audible or yeah, yeah. you know, audiobook or whatever. But I felt like this book really spoke to where I'm at in my business. So I was like, I need it in my hands. I need mm. to mark it up. I need to dog tag it, you know, all that good stuff. Mm. And I'm finding that it's taking me a really long time to get through it because there's so much good information and I really want to take my time with it. So tell me a little bit about why, why is this the next book? You've written several books. Why this one? Tracy, I sent an email out to my list of readers just seeing what their challenges are, what needs are. And this took me five years to write this book. So five years ago, I emailed my readership and say, what's the biggest challenge you're facing? But admittedly, I'm not the most techie guy. I must have triple clicked or something because the email went out like multiple times. But here's the interesting thing. I, in the email, I said, what is the biggest challenge you face this year? And some people responded, the same person responded multiple different answers to that same email. Like in the morning when the email went, they said, my biggest challenge is sales. In the afternoon, when I actually sent the second email, their response was, my biggest challenge is hiring. And then by the end of the day, it was like vision. And I'm like, oh my gosh. Sounds became, like a business owner. <laughs> yeah. It, it became very clear for me that the biggest challenge business owners and entrepreneurs face is knowing what the biggest challenge is that they have. Yeah. So that became the inception of this book. How do we pinpoint the one thing our business needs us to work on. Right, right. You know, you kind of go into, you know, reading a book or into a coaching session or anything like that with top of mind issues that you're having at the time, like putting band-aids on stuff is not helping. You know, it's just, just like you say in the book, it's, you're just fixing the little things. You got to look at the bigger picture. And so one of the first things I did was took the fix it next test. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. How'd that go? I I have mixed emotions about it. So okay. it, it told me I needed to work on sales, which I'm like, ah, I work. I feel like I work on sales every minute of the day. Yeah, it gets frustrating, right? When you hear that's still the problem, yeah? Yes, okay. yes. So I guess my question to you is, isn't that always going to be a thing for any business owner? I mean, how do you decipher? Great you question. You really, really need to focus on it because of profiting or whatever, or... It just always kind of needs to be in the background going. But well, yeah, you- everything must be going. The question is what needs to be fixed next? So uh, I'll show you. This is the back of the book. Uh, yeah. It's called The Business Hierarchy of Needs. And this is what the basically the essence of the book is right here. It is the five foundational needs that every business has. So foundationally, sales is necessary. It is the creation of cash. To me, it's the, the oxygen of a business. No sales, your business is suffocating. But right. The next question is, it, is it simply adequate to support profit? And uh, we have to then investigate profit. Do we have any profit coming in? If there's none and we have some sales, it's actually probably a profit problem. But if there's some profit, maybe revert back to we need to amplify sales to increase profit. We keep on going up the, the level. So it's sales first, then profit, then order, which is the organizational efficiency, no dependency on the owner and themselves, impact of the creation of transformation, the highest level is legacy. So sales is always the starting point of investigation, but it doesn't necessarily mean the next fix that we need. We will cycle through this. You simply need adequate sales to support sustainable profits. You just need adequate profit to support sustainable efficiency. And that's how we cycle through this. So some businesses don't get frustrated. It's like, I've been working on sales for 20 years. I want to move on. (laughs) No, and I'm not saying it's your case, but no, we need to resolve it and put a permanent stamp on it. To your other point is, Once sales is addressed, sales will continue. It's not like we ignore these things. Right. There's things that run in the background. It's just where do we need to fix things? It's kind of like the human makeup. Maslow argued that physiological needs, our base level needs, like air, drinking water, is the most essential need to be satisfied. But once it's satisfied, we can move on to other needs, like belonging to a community, companionship, ultimately self-actualization. But while we're while you're hanging out with friends, community, uh, you're still breathing automatic 
if it's illogical. Same thing in our business. Right. Once we satisfy sales, you'll move up quickly, but then you have to keep this on automatic. But also a business will revert back to the base. Even the mighty Amazon, who was focusing on impact and legacy when the pandemic broke, reverted right back to sales. And they had to figure out a new sales structure, moving to essential products and stop selling other things. So yes. every business will cycle through this. Right. My biggest question is always like, we'll have a really good sales day. And I'm like, why? I want to know why we had such good sales. And it's so hard to figure out. And then you hope that all that work I did with all the marketing, it's paying off. And then, you know, our sales kind of go up and down. We're obviously in real estate. So it, it's based on what the market's doing kind of all across the United yeah. States. Yeah, but it's so hard to like, how do you, how do you figure that out? Yeah, so the, the solution is always in what's called empirical data. We need numbers behind it. Most yeah. of us try to guess our way there. We actually try to rely on our gut or instinct. Like, oh, yeah. it feels like it was probably our marketing. Oh, it's something else. But actually, my research I talk about in the book, instinct fails us tremendously when it comes to running a business. Yes. It does support us in our personal lives. And that's why we rely on instinct so much. Like if yes. you and I were hanging out, we're like, hey, let's let's uh, go for a walk. And we decide to cut down some short alley as a shortcut. But we get like the, the sensation that there's going to be harm put upon us. We better turn around because someone's going to come there and attack us. Like right. that's our senses triggering it, sight, smell. We are neurologically wired into ourselves, but we're not neurologically wired into our business. Yet we're so good at instinct for our self-preservation. We think it'll work in our business preservation and it won't. So you have to get empirical data. And the easiest way to get empirical data in the sales field is ask customers. So if you have a good sales day and you convert all these customers, we ask them, what compelled you to join us? And you interview them. And uh, you may find out, oh, you know, we've heard about you 20 times because of your marketing. And then we decided to move ahead. Maybe that indicates your marketing's working. Other ones may say, oh, you, I was referred to you by such and such person. And you hear that they're a common referral point. So we have to ask to find out why. And then we amplify what's working and we diminish and repackage what's not. I love that advice because those are both things on my to-do list is get a data person to analyze data because that's just not in my wheelhouse. And then also asking the customers, have you heard of BombBomb? Yeah, I know it very well. Yeah. Okay. So it's been in our industry for a really long time and some realtors use it a lot, but we had a customer, he sends us questions from BombBomb and I never knew that that's what it was. I just knew that Oh, we're getting another video message from Pat. And we love that. He had some questions and we ended up Zooming yesterday. I was like, what is that video you're using? He's like, it's bomb bomb. I'm like, no way. And it got my wheels turning. I'm like, I'm going to start using that in my business. And that's exactly what I want to do is talk to customers and like show them the product and be like, this is what it looks like. Yeah, 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 yeah. That kind of thing. So I love being able to use that and asking them why you ordered what you ordered and when and all that good stuff. So important, so important and so overlooked. We, yeah. we usually just guess. And the other point with the bomb bomb application, what you're talking about is tactile experience. So it's interesting in this market in particular, as everyone's been thrust back home, sure. we're getting less and less tactile experience, part yeah. of Maslow's belonging. So we don't see each other as much. Yeah. So video is becoming actually more important. Zoom live video is nice, but to send emails where you're sending video-based emails is a big differentiator because so few do it, yet it services that tactile experience. So people appreciate it so much more. Yeah. You do it quite a bit in your email marketing. And I used to send out one email a week and then we started with two. So we do a Wednesday and a Sunday night one. And the Sunday one, I didn't know how it was going to do. Realtors, you know, work a lot. Um, Most of their work time is, well, was on the weekends, you know, doing open houses and, and whatnot. So I wasn't sure how the Sunday email was going to go. And it, it does better almost than the middle of the week one. And I never thought to put a video in there. And I love that because I love people. I love my realtor community and I love our customers and the relationship is really important to us. And so I, that's a really good idea. I'm going to do that. There you go. Do it. <laughs> I know. And it's so funny because I get your emails and I just never thought about doing that putting the video in the email. That's actually, you know, when it comes to the sales, actually all these levels, uh, but the sales level in particular is observation of other vendors and how they relate to you and what resonates with you. Because often um, if we look at only our internal community, we have a very myopic vantage point. But if we look outside of our community to other types of vendors, and see what's resonating with us. Now we have stuff that we can R and D rip off and duplicate. Right. <laughs> we can R and D and throw into our community and really differentiate ourselves. Yeah. Okay. So that brings me to another part of your book that I really loved. And last week we were focusing that 
in our marketing was collaborations and mm. strategic alliances. So is there a difference between a strategic alliance and a collab? Is it the same thing? Is there... Yeah, you know, it's terminology, I guess, thrown around. Yeah. So joint venture, strategic alliance, collaborative environment. These, these are terms that are getting so bastardized, it's really hard to distinguish. Right. To me, there is a, a true definition of collaborative is a symbiotic relationship where both parties, by working together, gain without having to have a transaction, meaning just by working together, we both gain exposure, we both, both gain benefit, but we don't have to have an interaction between each other financially. Yes. These joint ventures or other relationships is one side is accommodating for uh, not gaining as much by paying the other side or vice versa, where yeah. a monetary transaction. I also believe that when there's monetary transactions, the relationship fundamentally changes. So if I'm actively supporting someone by, because by supporting them, I'm also winning. It's a different relationship that I'm actively supporting someone expecting some money in return. There's a fundamental shift. So that's how I see the differentiation. Right. We want to do collabs, but it's been so hard for us to figure out how it's going to be a win-win. And we get more people wanting to collab with us and, and our customers really want to engage with us. We're a lot different than most retailers because we're in real estate. And so it's all very human. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so much human that goes into buying a house and realtors buying product from us. It's, it's just a different relationship than most. And so we really get to, that's my favorite thing. And so it's so cool that I get to have that in my business. And it's something that I love doing. And we talked to realtors last week in our podcast about collabing and making it a win-win and really having something charted out so that when you go to that person, but it got me to thinking too, like, I think I need to look at some strategic alliances that are bigger. Like this is, we're collabing right now. You know, we're, mm -hmm. I'm putting this on the podcast and, you know, I think that it, just by having, getting to ask you questions to me, this is a collab as well. And then your marketing people reached out, maybe we'll sell your book at our store and that kind of stuff too. So Right, right. So, you know, one question we can always ask too in a collaborative environment is, what's your currency? I mean, that's even too sophisticated for a word. Being basically, what's your selfish interest? Right. And so, I'm doing this. I hope to gain further exposure, and perhaps right. you look to better serve your community in a new way, so they're more ingratiated with you. Yes. So that's a both. That's a win-win. But we need to get that on the table quickly. So I often ask people, hey, what's the currency for you? Because if we're not exchanging money, there's got to be a win for you. But we got to have clarity on what that win is. And my win, when you know the two outcomes, then it becomes much easier to navigate the path together that will solve or serve both the wins. I love that. Yeah, I'll be honest. I was a little selfish when I was like, because usually, I mean, any information is good information when it comes to business because, you know, some things relate to some people and some don't. Sure. And so hopefully something out of this is going to hit with someone. But for me, I was like, I want to ask about my business stuff, the sure. stuff I'm going through. I have an expert here. I'm like, and it'll benefit everybody else too. But usually it's the other way around where I'm like thinking about everybody else. <laughs> so I like, know that's <laughs> smart. That's a smart approach. I love it. I'm going to be a little selfish this time. So you talked a little bit about your book taking you five years. Is it just a, a nat we talked about gut instinct and things like that. Is it just, you're just writing as things come and then you just decide which ones you want to finish up first. Is there a succession in the book? Yeah, there's or a, there's a process. So I, I always ask my readership, what do you need? What do you need? And I'm constantly asking and it starts building these books that work together. Fix this next is the hub, the center book because it pinpoints. Oh, wow what you need next. Then once you know it, I have other books, which you can see I strategically position yep. by myself. Which I love on marketing. your book. Your book but I have other books there that serve like efficiency and selling and marketing and profitability. And the reason it takes five years is I don't know if I'm like a typical author. I don't just write. I first uh, come up with a hypothesis. I start conducting interviews of other businesses and I own three businesses. So we start testing it. So I meet with the president of each of my companies and say, here's, here's the new crazy thing. We got to try this out. So right now, uh, the office I'm in right now, we are running a test on basically how to get employees to act like owners. It's a very common question. We've been testing it now for almost a year uh, and I've done research for two years for that. So that book, we're about three years in and I may start writing in about another year. So that may take about six years to get it done. But I, I guinea pig on my own businesses and other companies. 
another book I'm working on right now is as a marketing. And I just, it's funny, we're, we're actually testing products. There's a coffee company called Cottonwood Coffee in South Dakota. Okay. And uh, we're just, this is the, the, the first batch, batch number one of this brand new coffee they invented, oh, wow. which has an immune booster built into it. And the concept is different is better. Coffee is usually just coffee. It has caffeine, but it doesn't have anything for your health. But with the COVID situation, I was going to say, you pushed yeah, it through. They rapidly developed this. And um, <laughs> the owner just texted me this morning. His name is Jacob Limmer. He said, this is flying off the shelf. They can't keep it in stock. Wow. And um, it all came out of testing concepts about being different. So his story is likely going to be in the future book. We're testing stuff out like this right now. That's so cool. So you have other businesses. Are they based around your book or are they completely other businesses? Everything's a derivative of my book. So when I wrote okay. Profit First, we realized there was an opportunity to certify accountants and bookkeepers in it. So we started Profit First Professionals. Uh, this business where I am, when I wrote Fix This Next, it was very clear that people wanted to fix this next advisor. People that come in and go yeah. beyond this, the basic diagnostic and really pinpoint and help those businesses. So we started an advisory group. So that's what's in this office. Clockwork, we have an educational center. I also am an investor in an augmented reality company. I used to have a manufacturing business too in St. Louis, so I just exited from that. These businesses I own, I'm a shareholder. And, and actually, this is something else I'm writing about often is a lot of entrepreneurs now define entrepreneurship as grind and hustle. I got to work my butt off because I'm an entrepreneur. And I think that's the bastardization of that term. Entrepreneurship is someone that has a vision of an outcome and then choreographs resources and people and technology to make that outcome a reality. It's not about work our butts off. Yes. So I love the word entrepreneur, but I don't like what it's become. So yeah. I'm a shareholder in small business as opposed to the entrepreneur of small business. Yeah. And I'm with you on that. When I hear like rise and grind and all that, I, I mean, that just sounds like you have to go to work and entrepreneurs don't think like that. They, exactly. they just do, you know, it's just in their DNA and they usually love what they do, hopefully. But I think that you're just such an entrepreneur because that's just what you do. You, you have the book and then you think of the other businesses that kind of go with it. And I always tell people too, because I also own a real estate company, you know, people are like, Oh, you do so much. I'm like, yeah, but it's all in the same wheelhouse. It all kind of, they all come together and work together in different ways in my brain. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's how I justify it. <laughs> I'm like, it's not it. like I'm trying to be a horse trainer and, you know, right, right. sell real estate supplies. Right. It's all collective. So I think realtors really, you know, that's obviously who our listeners are, but I'm hoping that they're listening to this, thinking about their business, because that's one of the biggest mistakes that realtors make is that they are so busy worrying about everybody else in the transaction and, you know, whether they're buying or selling and that kind of stuff. They don't think about I tell them all the time, you're little mini corporations. You're, oh, yeah. You're all walking businesses. Yeah. Micro enterprise, I call it. You could be an entrepreneur of one or a business of one, and that's a business. Yeah. Um, and yeah. you need to treat it that way. And when we have transactions, we have to also, we have to first put the oxygen mask on ourselves, right? To, to protect other people. I say it all the time. You got to. And um, you see, especially in this environment that people are sacrificing themselves to such an extreme, they're crushing their business, which means yep. ultimately they can't be of service in the future. So they're crushing others by doing that. Yeah. I can't wait for your next book to come out about the staff because I have a staff of seven. Uh, one of them is my son and they're all under the age of 29. And, you know, not everybody wants to be an entrepreneur. You know, some people no. just want to come to work and that's fine too. But I'm, they're all so young, so I feel like they're all my kids. And I think it's so exciting that they get to learn this business with me. But sometimes I'm worried that I'm not doing the, I'm not leading well with that. Like when you talk about leadership and things like that, and there's a lot of realtors that have teams, so I'm sure they're interested in this as well. How do you view or visualize that? Just like you were saying, you're doing some research right now. The, yeah, so we're researching it and it plays into the order level of Fix This Next. Yes. Uh, it's, it's called intentions alignment. I, I detail it in the book, but in intention alignment, the big realization is setting corporate goals is a mistake because corporate goals are not compelling for our team. Individual goals, like what do I want for my own life is what matters most yeah. to me. And so what we do is you align everyone's intentions. As an example, we only have 12 people here. We're tiny. Of our staff, when we did intentions alignment, we found that half the people wanted to learn Spanish. We're all English speaking. Oh, and wow. so like, oh, okay, we should start Spanish classes. And we found one person was buying a house. Not that we're going to buy the house for them, 
but we gave them more flexibility in their job schedule so they could find that house of their dreams. And wow. as we do that, as we support their individual intentions, the intention of the organization is just part of that path. So we're all marching a path together. That's the idea. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. This was one of my questions too, was you said with the company's sales performance, it's really about personal comfort and I'm a risk taker. So it doesn't, I, I don't get too worried about stuff, but then I worry about that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah right, right, right. So I'm like, is my, like the outcome that I want, is it really what I think it is in my comfort level as a one person? Is that really what I should be thinking about in my business? Uh, I'm just a little unclear. Like the sales performance. I have a number in my head. You know, you kind of do that. Oh, should I be worried about the number? Or, yeah, yeah, like yeah. where? <laughs> and I know data and all that stuff has to go into it, but I yeah. operate just like how you said in the book. And I was like, am I doing that right? I'll give you a quick answer. So we need to do what's called lifestyle congruence. And lifestyle congruence is understanding what we actually want as a business owner in our life and then back calculating the sales to support it. Most businesses don't do that. Most business owners say, I think I need 100,000 in sales or maybe it was a million or maybe it's 5 million. And we keep on making these arbitrary numbers yes. and we'll never get to it. We've got to look at our lifestyle support. Like what do we need for our comfortable life? Then determine the sales and link those two together. That's how you get started. I like that answer. That's a good way to end, Mike. Great. Okay, so your book, I took the cover off, but you guys go get Fix This Next. It's, it's on Amazon. Actually, real quick, Tracy, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll share something. Um, I'm giving a little bonus. Um, yeah. This would be really cool. I ask that you pick this up on Amazon right now. It's the most effective and affordable way I can serve you. Five years, and I think this is the best book I've ever written in my life. It's the most important. So wow. I promise you, it'll serve you in your real estate endeavors. In fact, I have a local real estate agent that's used this to great effect already. Love it. Secondly, I'm, I'm asking that you get it now selfishly because it will also serve me. This is my launch week of my book. So if you pick it up right now, it starts the Amazon engine to market it to other entrepreneurs. So it's a great way for fellow entrepreneurs to discover it. So it will yeah. serve me too. Yes. And if you do decide to get it, email me. It's right on the book itself, mike at mikemichalowitz.com. So email Mike at MikeMcCallis.com and say, I love Tracy Hicks. If you put in the subject line, I love Tracy yes. Hicks, that's our code. You've bought the book. I will send you, I have about 50 sections, 50 pieces of this book called The Lost Content. It's stuff I wrote that ultimately mm. we didn't include. So it's all the bonus content from this book. I'll email it right back to you. It's on the honor system. You don't have to send me the receipt. I know you got it. Just email me, Mike at MikeMcCallis.com, Tracy Hicks rules, put it on there. Um, or I love Tracy Hicks, put that in there so I can see it. It will serve you. I promise you. And it will serve me. So thank you. I love that. I love that. Well, thanks for your time, Mike. I'm, I'm so excited. I'm just going to sit here after this and like write my notes down and think about my business for a minute. And I really appreciate, you know, everything that you're doing for the entrepreneur community and small businesses and big business, everybody. I think you're fantastic. So thanks you for rock. being on. Tracy, thank you. Be <laughs> thanks, well. Mike. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.